Father, in the name of Jesus, we just, we just thank you, God, for your grace. God, thank you for your presence here today. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that allowed us to come into your kingdom. And you adopted us as your children. And I thank you and praise you for that. Thank you, God. We have the spirit of adoption upon us. And we thank you, God. We don't have an orphan spirit, God. That's cut off and that's broken off in Jesus' name. But we have the spirit of adoption upon our lives. You've adopted us. You translated us out of the kingdom of darkness. Yes. And you brought us into your family in right relationship with you because of your son and what he has done. We didn't deserve any of it, but we sure do receive it today. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for the angels of God that are here in this place. Holy Spirit, I acknowledge your presence today. I thank you're here. Leading, guiding, teaching, and training us. In the name of Jesus, we give you thanks. Every spirit of deception, lies, innuendo, I forbid your operation right now in the name of Jesus. In the spirit of truth, you're here. And we thank you and we receive you right now in Jesus' name. Amen. That spirit of adoption is something that should not be taken lightly because adoption is, is really more powerful than just having birth. Yes. It's a choosing. You, you, it's a choosing of someone. You, God made a choice for us, right? Yes, yes. The spirit of adoption is much stronger than just being birthed into a family. Because when you're adopted, someone says, I want you. That's right. I want you. And I'm going to do all of these things to make it happen. Really, it kicks it up into a whole nother realm. So we so don't take lightly the spirit of adoption in our lives. We've been adopted into the God's kingdom. That's not my message, but I just I need to throw that out there. Uh, Elisa, I, I do want you to come up here because you were on my heart last night. And so I call I called uh, Elisa last night and she, her phone. She, she told me uh, her phone was in the car. Well, I didn't call you. I'm sorry. I texted you and I didn't know. And then she texted me back. But you were on my heart. I read your testimony. Mm -hmm. And could you please. And, and I know I'm putting you on the spot here. Mm -hmm. uh, could you please give that testimony to everyone here kind of the backstory also and, and I say backstory because ever since I've come into the kingdom when it, when people tell me about a testimony and whatnot I want to hear the backstory I want to hear the rest Paul Harvey used to say <laughs> the rest of the story because believe me, when you hear God that does something in someone's life, there is the rest of the story that you don't get to. And I want you to please come up here and, and tell us the rest of the story. Well, very briefly, um, I've been a bit frustrated because everybody always talks about walking in the spirit. And I don't know what that means. I honestly just don't know what that means. I know what it means. I, I have a lot of logos in me, but um, so I'm frustrated. And then I had some things happen at home that, um, that increased my sense of urgency. 
And so I started pressing in and listening to a few teachings and I was just crying out. I was very frustrated. And um, I watched this one teaching called um, Walking in the Spirit Made Simple. <laughs> <laughs> Because I like to complicate everything, right, right. you know, and so he kind of broke it down. It was a 23-minute teaching, and somehow the way he presented it, uh, it, it kind of hit me, and and I had some great revelation. I mean, it was just, you know, it was incredible, and um, uh, I realized that this term, walking in the spirit, had become to me just Christianese, yeah. just something that we say, and we just assume that we know what it means, and but then we're powerless, and we're frustrated, and we're sort of stuck. Yeah. And, um, and then sometimes we even go so far as to think, well, this just isn't working for me. And that's not, that's not true. You know, we, we're not getting it. And, um, or at least for me, I wasn't getting it. So um, when, I did, when it dawned on me that um, God wasn't trying to fix me or heal me, he basically killed me. <laughs> yes. He wanted me dead so that the new creation could live. Mm -hmm. oh, and yes, then yes. when I got that, and my, all, suddenly my prayers completely changed, mm -hmm. and I looked back at my journal, and I saw that I just kept asking him for things that were moot. <laughs> right. You know, it was, it was done already. What, what, right. Why am I praying for these things? He, th that was me, and I was living in the idea and the memory of those things. And he was just standing there waiting and saying, you know, mm -hmm. you're asking me to do something that, <laughs> you know, I really don't need to do. <laughs> yeah. So um, it was literally beating a dead horse. <laughs> yeah. My prayers were beating a dead horse. It was just ridiculous. And um, when, when I got that revelation, it was truly life-changing. Yeah. You know, it was amazing. And I wonder how many others are walking around like me for 30 years saying, yeah, walking in the spirit, <laughs> you know, and not really understanding, you know. I mean, because the concept is there. We sort of know it, but somehow it has to hit us a certain way. We it has to reckon show ourselves dead, dead, just like you did. Right. Reckon ourselves dead. Right. Yeah. We're dead. Our life is Christ in us. The hope of glory. glory. It yes. is no longer me who lives, but he who lives in, in me. me. Yes. Now yes. everything changes. The purpose of everything changes. Yes. The, you know, the, the reason for everything changes. Yes. So You start to be awesome. So that's what happened to me this week. Praise God. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you. So she is walking in the spirit. Where is that? Somebody knows where that's at, don't you? It's in a couple of different places in the word. Right? Yeah. In Galatians. Yeah. Galatians. So, someone pull that up for me, please. In Galatians. We'll, we'll just kind of look at that very briefly. But yes, we are called to walk in the Spirit. The problem with the, with the, with the church is we've walked in the natural. Yeah. Called it the Spirit. We've walked in the natural. And in case we don't know what the natural is, the Scriptures tells us what the natural is. So that way we don't even have to try to figure it out. Right. What is that? Galatians what? Somebody? 5.16. You want to read that, Mr. Mr. Peterson? I say then, walk in the spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh, lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. These are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Stop. Stop right there. Full stop. Okay. Did you, did you hear that last uh, part? Read that last sentence again. These are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. Stop. It says that walking in the spirit and walking in the flesh are contrary to one another. In other words, they are what? Diametrically opposed to one another. You can't do both and think you're going to be successful in either one of them. We all know the term uh, a jack of all trade and master of none. This is what we become. We're trying to have one foot in the spirit that that was just said today mm -hmm. and one foot in the flesh. Right. Now you say, well, what is the flesh? Continue reading, sir. If you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. 
Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> now, did you notice what the Spirit of God uh, had, the, had uh, the Apostle Paul say here? He said, um, and I'm going to kind of paraphrase it for you. He, d he comes through a list here, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, you know, the whole nine. And he says, and the like. In other words, and if there's anything else that looks anything like this, we're including that into the yeah, list. Exactly. Anything else that's flesh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So God's covering it all. But there's a good but. Read the but. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. There is no law. In other words, there's nothing that can stop you and I if we walk in love, joy, peace, yeah. temperance, meekness. Right? Gentleness, self control. Right? Did, do you believe that? Yes. So we just have to walk in it. And yes, it is a challenge. Mm -hmm. It's a challenge for all of us. But we can do it. You and I are destined to look like who when God is finished with you? Christ. 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 That's who God is molding and shaping you and I to look like. There is no other example in the word of God. If you want to know, you, you know, we went through this and I said this months ago. We went through that, that time where we said, what would Jesus do? I, I, I get it and I, I got that and, and I understood what people met when they said that, but it was just off enough to get people messed up. Yep. You, you, I guess you really could say, be more accurate, what would Jesus look like doing what I should be doing? Yeah. How would he conduct himself in this manner? And once you, if you want to ask that question, then your next question is, Holy Spirit, show me. Because you are not going to be able to take a situation and, and just say, well, Jesus called them uh, scribes and wolves, and that's what I'm going to do. Yeah. Well, no. Unless the Spirit of God puts that on you, then I wouldn't do that. <laughs> right? But maybe sometimes you're just supposed to just walk in love and move on. Maybe you're supposed to answer. Maybe you answer things with a soft answer. Yeah, that's a tough one when somebody's screaming in your face. I've been there. You've been there. We've all been there, right? Walk in the spirit. So this we will do. Now we can go into the message. That was, that was the introduction. Turn in your Bibles to Psalms 95. I'm not going to get, to, I'm not going to get, to get this done. Yes, sir. Let me add, it's interesting. The things of God don't need a law. That's why there's no law. Things, because good things don't need laws. Laws are always given in restrictive restrain. form. What you can't do. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. restrain, right? they restrain evil. Yeah, it, exactly. it, what are the Ten Commandments? They weren't thou shalt, they were thou shalt not. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. In God's world, in his perfect world, there are no thou shalt nots because there's no need for them because 
you wouldn't do what Jesus wouldn't do. And that's part of the problem with the question of what would Jesus do is what you're actually asking is, let's see, is there a law against this or can I do it? <laughs> yeah. There you go. Splitting the hairs. Sorry, you ought to know that before you ask the question. Yeah. If you have to ask the question, probably not. <laughs> it's probably not. Right. That's true. That's when true. We walk in the spirit, we don't need laws. That's right. We don't violate them. Yeah. Amen. That's beautiful. That's it. What verse are you on? 95. No, what, what, Psalm 95. Oh, come let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to, uh, to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. I, I think we did some of this today. Yes, we did. Okay. Let us shout joyfully with him psalms. For the Lord is the great God and the great king above all gods. Yes. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his and he made it and his hands form the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. As in the rebellion. As in the day of trial in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me, they tried me there, though they saw my work. For 40 years, I was grieved with that generation and said, it is a people who go astray in their hearts and they do not know my ways. They shall not enter my rest. I'm not going to continue on, but the psalmist here begins to go where he was going in the first part of Psalms 95, and he begins to continue to praise God in Psalms 96. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 3. Now, in Hebrews, again, I, I think we covered this before about the Hebrew children and what the, the context of Hebrews is all about. But for people that were, were not here the last time I covered it, I will say something about it. The book of Hebrews was written, written to people who had turned their lives over to, to Jesus, to Yeshua. But now they were being persecuted because now they were they were being told, no, you can't do that. They were being ostracized, um, close to being martyred. No one had been martyred at the time that this was was written. And so there was this temptation now to go back to Judaism. Right. So the, the so the author of Hebrews is writing to the Jewish people to try to tell them and explain to them and let them know, no, guys, you can't go back. Right. And the reason we, do, we don't go back is Jesus, Yeshua, is greater than everything we knew about. He is the fulfillment of what God was, has, has sent to us. He's greater than Moses. He's greater than the angels. He's greater than Joshua. He is the high priest with the great sacrifice for our lives. What are you going back to? Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing to go back to. Peter said one time, the Lord said when, when the 70 walked off, he looked at the other 12 and said, you guys want to go too? And Peter said, where are we going? Where will we go? You're the one with the word of life. They understood that part. 
They didn't maybe didn't, didn't have it all together, but they understood that. In 2010, when God took my life through a series of changes, I knew at that time that when God was dealing with me and Stephanie and we were and it was this was a wilderness experience. This was a wilderness experience. We had come to a point and I had come to a point in my life and you, you have to talk to Stephanie about how God was dealing with her. But in my particular life, I had come to a place where God, I literally was answering that question. God was saying to me, what are you going to do? Are you going to serve me or not? And I had been a believer. I had been a son for years. But it came to the it, it, it was at a point in time. God was saying, now we're, 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 get, we're getting serious here. I need a I need you to give me a commitment on a much greater level. Yeah. Yeah. And I also knew that attached to that, there were some consequences. I knew it. And I walked around for days. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Because this was, this, was, this was what was going through my mind and my heart. Do I serve God or I don't? This, this, this is not a good place to be. How do I do this? I don't, know, I don't know if I can do this. I went through all of that. And after, I don't know, probably, I don't know. I guess it, was, it, it took me about three or four days to work through it. Finally, I, rem, I, I can see it to this day. I remember I was walking in the trees and I said, OK, God. I'm done. I'm following you. I really don't know what that means. I just had to be honest. I did not know what it meant, and I did not know where we were going. And I just stood there and I said, okay, I'm going. I'm not turning back to Egypt. Amen. The door was closed. And from that moment on, God began to do things in my life every day. He began to show me his grace every day. I was driving in the car one day and I was just praising God coming home from work. And his presence was so manifest in that car. I was actually, it, it was tangible. And I was going through all this stuff the world, my world around me seemed like it exploded. But on the inside, I had peace. But externally, it felt like all hell was breaking loose. Kind of some of the stuff we just kind of went through. But this time, it's for a different purpose. Yeah. Got this time where we came out for the last 13 months, where we've been, in case you didn't know, me and Stephanie and my family have been living in a hotel for 13 months. This time, it was to take me deeper. It wasn't about being committed. However, from your perspective, it looks the same. The first time was for your for your person. Yes. This time was for, for your kingdom. calling. Yes. Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And a settling has come in my life. I, I you know I don't want to I don't want to go through all of that right now, but it it, it felt like almost like a crushing in some respects. And, and I'm not even given this. It's true. It's yeah. True. It, it felt like a crushing, but at the same time, it felt liberating. It, 
You ever, ever have a sneeze and you go, God, that hurt, but it felt so good. Yeah. <laughs> Something like that. I'm not doing justice to what I'm saying here, but you understand what I'm talking about. Okay. Well, what, what's, the, what's the point he's trying to make? Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart like the children of Israel did. And it turned into rebellion. God has given this tribe a place to go. We're going somewhere and we're going to be doing some things. Let's think about that for a second. Most people think that they rebelled when God said, send the spies into the land. Right? That's, that's the obvious point of rebellion that we read in the scriptures. But it started way before that in God's mind. Mm -hmm. It's a whole package deal as, as far as God's concerned. We take it in segments. God looks at the beginning to the end. They cried out. God said, I'm here to deliver you. And then he proceeded to show his miracles to the Israelites and to the Egyptians. Right. Did he not? Yes, he mm -hmm. did. They were delivered, were they not? Yes. Yes. They came out in glory, right? Yep. Signs, wonders were all around. It was great. It was beautiful. Did you see God do that? Everybody was high-fiving one another. If they could high-five. I don't know. Metaphorically. Yeah. I'm just trying to contemporize the word for you a little bit. <laughs> Everybody's having a great old time. We're watching. We see Pharaoh's army was drowned. They're having a party. They're, they're singing songs. It, all life is great. Holy smoke, this is cool. Three days into the journey. <laughs> Where's the water? If you go and read the, if you go and read it, look at their attitude. You know, one thing I noticed, I'm sitting there reading through this, I'm going, what? You just, came, you just came through all these miracles. You just came through all of this great stuff. There wasn't one person, not one, that, would, that came to Moses and said, hey, Moses, you know, God just delivered us out of Egypt. He's done some great things. You think he could rustle up some steaks for us? <laughs> What about some punch or some Kool-Aid to go with that? <laughs> Not one person said that. But you know what they did say? Why has God brought us out here to destroy us and cause we don't even have anything to drink? In fact, he brought it to water that was bitter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Just to see how they would handle it. Yep. They could have just said, got on their knees and asked the Lord to make the water fresh. Yeah. Our God can do anything. That don't mean anything. Right. They had just come through miracles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask a question here. Have we seen some miracles? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes, we have. Nah, but that's the Israelites. That wouldn't be us. <laughs> so we don't have to worry about that, right? Mm. <laughs> Not so. Hmm. I think 
Mount Sinai is right out there. Somewhere. Yeah, uh -huh. <laughs> I'm wondering. I'm wondering. The scripture says we are not made perfect in and of ourselves, but we are made perfect through them. Right. It's we, we need to look at what happened to them. Then the next thing that came along, they had the waters, of, the bitter waters at Mara, and then they go and they, they say, you know, we don't have any food. They complained about that. And let's, let's turn, and I don't want you to see something. Let's turn to what God says to them. I want you to see something. Let's go to uh, Numbers. Numbers 14. No, uh, I think it's 13. I'm, I'm sorry. Because I'm going to wrap it up here pretty quick anyway. Because I can't get through all of this. Let me make sure. I just want you to read it for yourself. Read through. I think it's Numbers 13. No, Numbers 13 is them spying out the land. I'm sorry. Um, what I'm thinking about and what's, what's in my heart is they asked for food. And we, we don't have that. It probably would have been in Exodus then. Yeah, there, there is a different one in Exodus. That's true. Um, Exodus, go to Exodus 20. I'm sorry. But before you go there, let's go to Exodus 15. I'm sorry. I'm going to bounce, I'm going to bounce you around. You're getting, a little, you're getting a little finger exercise. I want you to see something, what God says to them, as when they came out. I want to plug this into your thinking. In Exodus 15, verse, um, we're talking about, we were talking about the bitter waters made sweet. Uh, verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out from the wilderness of Shur. And, and they went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now, when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah, for, there were, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Marah. Okay. And the people complained against Moses, saying, now watch it. Notice that they did not complain against God. They, they thought they were sidestepping God and complaining against the leader. Uh, that's not how God took it. Lesson and in, in case in point. Um, be careful how you complain against your leaders. I'm not talking about just here. I'm, I'm just talking about in general. Yeah. Wherever you are, wherever God sends you, wherever, wherever you go, you, we have to have an attitude of servanthood. We're there to serve. And if there's a complaint, you know, that's what's so nice. We can go to the throne room many times and say, God, I think the man's messing up. I think the woman's messing up. And you know what? The father can straighten it out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because why? Couple things. You didn't call him. I didn't call them, and I am not supposed to be disciplining or, or worrying about another man's servant. Uh oh. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. So, if God calls them, pray for them. Father, they're messed up. If that's the way you want to pray, I wouldn't advise you praying that way. But if you want to pray that way, you go right ahead. I would say pray grace and mercy over them. Why? You sow that. Because what? You sow it. That's right. You sow it. Yeah. You say, well, that, that seems a little bit uh, self-serving. Sure. Okay. Because one day you may be in a position where you need mercy and grace. You might be in that position. You may be in that position. So here they are complaining against Moses. OK. And the people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? So he cried out with the cried out to the Lord and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it to it, cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. Then there he made a statute and an ordinance for them. And there he tested them. 
and said, listen to what God says here. If you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight. Whose sight? Yes. His sight. It may not be in the sight of other people, but in God's sight. Give ear. Do you notice what, you know, do you notice what the emphasis that God is putting on here? What, what's the emphasis? Where is this? Which, which five physical senses he putting the emphasis on? Hearing. 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 He that have ears to hear, let him hear. hear. Because those that hear will be given what? More. Right? right? That's the, that's the New Testament, what Jesus said in the New Testament. Be careful how you hear. I, I know I, sometimes I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I forget. We need to continue to go over foundational things in the scriptures. Because even though I know it, you may not know it. But hearing is one of the most important things you can do in the kingdom is the ability to hear. I used to tell my son and daughter all the time, and you ask them, hearing is a discipline. Yeah. It really is. Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe me, go to work and just listen to how people interact with their boss. I, see, I'm, I sit at work sometimes and, and the boss is trying to say something and people are blah, 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 blah. It's like, will you shut up and let the guy finish? <laughs> You can't have get things out of your mouth and people are running off at the mouth because listening is a discipline. Mo even more so in the kingdom. But notice what God says here. He says, if you will diligently heed. That is diligently listen. That is listening with that. That in, in the in the Hebrew has this meaning and connotation and, con and connotation. Listening with the intent to obey. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. It doesn't mean. Yeah, I heard it. <laughs> it doesn't mean that. That spins us into something different. That's why your words are important. We're very flippant with our words. So we think God's flippant with his words. Oh, I just love that. After a while, we begin to diminish the word love. Because we love roller coasters. Everything, chocolate, muffins. Sorry. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah, well, SpongeBob needed to go, so sorry about that. The muffins. It's replaced the word like. Yes. Yeah. You don't hardly use the word like anymore. It's I love it. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. So then when you get to use the word love, does it really mean the same thing? No. But then you come along and you and you and you meet God and you think he uses words like we use words. Uh -uh. Clue. He says, I'm upholding all things by the power of my word. You are created in the image of God. Your words matter. Is that true? Yes, they do. I would strongly, if you have a problem with words, I would strongly advise you to get Charles Capps, The Tongue of Creative Force. This is what's going to happen when you read that book. If your pendulum is over here, it will go here after you finish reading the book. But pray over yourself and allow the Holy Spirit to bring it to where it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. If you don't, don't understand what I'm talking about on words, you just go read through the book of Proverbs. It talks about a man with many words is not good. It actually puts us into a category of being a fool. 
So God's not like that. When he speaks a word to you, we need to sit up and take notice and go, ooh, oh, okay, all right. He means this. Yeah. Okay. Look, let's continue on. He said here, and do what is right in his sight and give ear to his commandments and keep all his stat statutes. And I will put none of the diseases on you, which I have brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your God who heals you. Now, do you notice that there was a promise attached to that word that God gave to them? Yeah. He said, but you have to listen, you have to hear, you have to obey. Yeah. This is right out of the box coming on the other side. He says this to them after that. And then they get into the and they get into the into the food issue. Then God says, OK, all right. So then the next thing they do, they, ha they, they wanted something to eat. Then God says, OK, fine, I'll give you manna. Then the instructions for the manna was, all right, you want manna? You're crying about it. I hear you. For six days, you'll go out and you'll get some manna. On the sixth day, on the, every day that you go out and you get manna, make sure everybody gets, I don't know, one pound of manna for each person in the house. If you got six people in the house, you get six pounds every day. No more, no less. Now, this is amazing. And, it's, and the word said that those that gathered more than they should have never had anything left over. But those that gathered, gathered less never was in lack. Notice how God balanced the whole thing out. Mm -hmm. But now, if you were told to go get six, then go, then go get a pound, go get six for your house. That was the instruction. Not 5.5. Not 7.5. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. In other words, don't go do what you think you ought to go do when God gave you the instruction. You know how we do. God says, uh, put, put two teaspoons in. Well, if two is good, three is better. No, it's not. That's rebellion. I'm sorry, it is. It is. Well, oh, okay. And if you get into rebellion, then what's, what accompanies that spirit? Uh, what? <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> there he goes. What accompanies rebellion? Witchcraft. witchcraft. <gasps> Christians can't get into witchcraft. You, you really? <laughs> Seriously? starts with control. There's a lot of that. There's a lot of that. Mm -hmm. yeah. The only thing you're supposed to control is you. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh, I stepped on some toes. <laughs> no, you're right on. I'm not here to control Grayson. No. I'm not here to control my wife. As a parent, yes, you do control your children to, a, at, to that certain point. And then when they get older, man, okay, you turn them over to the Lord and you begin to pray for them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's right and just and that's supposed the way that's supposed to work. But you and I are never to control people. We're to obey the Lord. Right? Mm -hmm. Witchcraft is equivalent to rebellion. Yes. Not good. <laughs> no. no. Ask Saul. Oh boy. Saul had a kingdom taken out of his hands by God because of it. Yeah. Sent the prophet Samuel down there and said, This day the kingdom has been ripped out of your hands. You're done. But, oh, but the manifestation of the, the kingdom being ripped out of his head took how long? You remember? Oh. I'm asking. Several, I don't know. It, it, was an, it was several years. Okay. It was decades. <laughs> 
the reason I'm saying that is because if you begin to walk in the flesh and begin to, and see things only by the flesh, you, you, you will miss the things of the spirit because it's in the spirit where you know what's really going on. Right. When, we, when we bought our house, and I, and I told you about it, we were going through a, a lot of different changes and, I, and, and all kinds of things were happening. God gave me a dream about the house and everything. And then uh, Stephanie called me one day and she said, oh, my God, um, paperwork's messed up. This is going on. Da, 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 da. And I was like, oh, what's going on? What's up? And then I said, OK. She said, well, she said, well, just, she said, just, just keep praying. I was like, OK. As soon as I hung up the phone, in my spirit, I read that God brought that dream up to me that I had. About the same time, she sends me a text and says, hey, what about that dream? Yeah. And it, it was a double confirmation. Right. I was like, got it. Mm -hmm. I spent all day praying. It was one of those days that I just happened to be able to pray in the spirit. <laughs> you don't believe that, do you? Mm -hmm. No such thing as coincidence. Yes. Yeah. Sets us God sets us up. Mm -hmm. I prayed in the spirit all day as God began to show me different things that were coming against us spiritually. I would come against it, take authority over it. I prayed in the spirit all day long. And then I got to a place. It was done. When we got the keys to the house. And we walked in. It was anticlimactic. <laughs> Battle had already the won. battle had already been won. I, and, and it was the strangest thing. We walked in and I was like, yeah, OK, cool. And I, and I kept thinking, wow, that's, that's God. I, this is kind of old hat now. <laughs> when we took possession of it, right. we had battled for it in the spirit realm. What well, we're going to do, what God's going to be doing with us over this space coast and over Florida and over every assignment that he's going to give to us. Right. All of this is not disconnected. I know. And, and I'm, I want you to understand that. It sounds like I'm speaking to you in fragments. But there's a lot of different things going on in the spirit realm here and people are picking up different pieces. That's kind of the way I'm seeing it. There's a lot of different pieces that people need and God's plugging some things in and taking some things out. And that's kind of what's going on in the spirit. God's going to be doing some things with us and using us. We must understand we Come together, we hear and we obey. That's it. That's it. <laughs> it's that simple. It is genuinely that simple. You hear and you obey. Yep. Go get one pound of manna in the backyard. Okay, God. <laughs> <laughs> one pound. What do I do with it next? And then you will get the next instruction. Right. Don't do what I did years ago. If one pound is good, three is better. No. <laughs> Be obedient. Now, if you, I heard the one lady that gave a testimony of uh, my, my cousin, um, God told her to put my cousin in her house. And she said, God, you know, I'm remodeling my house, getting some things done. Father, if, would it be OK if I put them up in a hotel? And Father, it's going to be a good hotel. I'm not, I'm not going to put them in Motel 6. <laughs> would that be OK? And God says, fine, that's fine. But she didn't do it yeah. without asking permission. And saying, Father, yeah, right. You said that I'm just going to go off and do this and, you, and you'll bless it. No. Because when she put them up in a nice hotel, it did cost her something. 
but she didn't go the cheap route. Could have. Mm -hmm. God wants you to know, obey. It's here. And I'm going to wrap this up. I don't think I could take this any further without. Listen, hear, obey, walk in the spirit. How do I walk in the spirit? You pray, you listen, and you obey. How do I do that? If you think it's God, act on it. Obviously, he's not going to tell you to go rob a bank. <laughs> okay? That six pounds wasn't enough. Right. <laughs> Act on it. And as you begin to walk in the spirit, you'll, you'll, you'll hear more and more. I'm talking to some of you young people. I'm talking to somebody in here about that. Because there's, there was a reason why God put you on my heart today, last night, about your testimony. And I know you had to get up here today. There's somebody in here that needed to hear that for you to walk in the spirit. How do I walk in the spirit? You trust God. If you hear something or you think you hear something, then act on it. That's the only, that's really the surefire way you're going to know whether it was God or whether it was, was not. That's, that's what the Holy Spirit was sent to do. He was sent to teach us everything. Everything. So that's why we need to know him mm -hmm. so that he can teach us everything to hear his voice, to, to hear, hear his the voice. father, to understand the word that's yes. been given to us. He is our helper. He's the one that stands alongside us. He's in us. He's the teacher. Amen. He's the comforter. We need him. If we're going to walk in the spirit, we need to know the spirit. We need to know the spirit. And our flesh can't hear him. No, no, no. Hey, hey, think about this. I haven't even talked to you about hearing and obeying angels. Right. Uh oh. I know. Just clicked it up another another notch, right? Uh -huh. It says, "Be careful. You could entertain angels unaware." Angels gave them direction in the Old Testament. That's right. He does that today. God will send an angel. You don't know. You just, when you're trying to just obey God, just obey God the best you know how. If you think you made a mistake, just say, Father, forgive me. I'm sorry. I, I think I blew it. And move on. Right. Learn to forgive yourself. Yes. Yes. You don't have to be perfect in God's kingdom. Right. You do not have to to be perfect in the kingdom. Right. That is self-imposed pressure. Perfection only exists in here. It's, anyway. it, right, it does. Perfection is only obedient. It, you, you, can't, you can't get there. Right. How are you going to get there? <laughs> we live in a corrupt world. If you built a brand new house and did nothing to it, after a few years, it'd fall down and, and be, be destroyed. Yeah. It will decay. Everything in this world decays. That's why we have to go after the incorruptible. Sorry. The incorruptible are the things of the spirit. Mm -hmm. Amen. The tree of life. I think we've eaten enough from the tree of the good and evil. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We've eaten enough of that. Because exactly. remember, the tree of, uh, of good and evil, that takes you away from God. Yeah. We want the tree of life. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you, for, thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for everything that you're doing. God, we purpose and plan in our heart to hear your voice and harden not our hearts, but we want to obey you. God, wherever we are in our walk with you, take us wherever we are, because that's who you are. And, and, and t just take us to that next step. Take us to the, to, the, to, the, to the next thing that we need to do. If we don't, if someone is here that doesn't really say, well, I, I'm not sure if I, I really hear God all that well. Father, I pray that they will get over that, 
I pray the Holy Spirit that you will help them. I know you're going to guide them and teach them because that is what you are faithful. You are the spirit of the living God. We thank you for that, God. I pray for everyone in this room, everyone under the sound of my voice, everyone that would ever listen or look at this video, that if, if that's something in their heart, that God, you will meet them right where they are. And God, that's the good news. You meet us where we are, but then you take us to greater heights in your kingdom. Father, Help us to see and work out the plans that you have for this, for this body, for this tribe here. God, you're the one that's molding us, shaping us. You're the one that's perfecting us. You're the one that's bringing us all together to go do an assignment that you have for us in this place. And we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. We give you thanks and we give you praise. We give you honor for everything in Jesus name. Amen. amen. And <clears throat> before and then hold on, let me say one quick thing. And I'm going to read it to you out of here. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you, the Lord. God Almighty, he, he has blessed this people and you are keeping us. You've got a hedge of protection around us. I thank you, Lord, that you have made your face to shine upon us. And you are gracious to us. Lord God, you have lifted up your countenance upon us. And you have given us your peace. We have peace the world didn't give it to us. They can't take it from us. So we thank you that we walk in your peace that flows on the inside of us. We thank you that your face shines upon our lives. Thank you, God. You intentionally turned your face towards us. And we receive that. We declare and decree that over everyone in this room and under the sound of my voice. We are a blessed people. The, from the works of our hands to the paths of our feet. And we declare it, we decree it, and we believe it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.